The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to our fourth webinar in the Invasive Species Center's Asian Carp Canada series. My name is Christine Pinckney and I'm the Asian Carp Project Coordinator here at the ISC. The Invasive Species Center has partnered with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada to develop the Asian Carp Canada project. This includes a series of this webinar focusing on the issues surrounding Asian carp. The webinar today is being recorded and it can be viewed on our website at www.asiancarp.ca. There will also be a question, period, answer, a question and answer period at the end of the presentation, so if you have a question, please type your question into the box in the, on the webinar panel and our pre presenter will try and answer as many as possible with the time available. Today I'd like to introduce you to Nicholas Mandrek. Nicholas is an Associate Professor at the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Toronto. He's also the Director of Professional Master's Program in Conservation and Biodiversity, and his research examines the biodiversity, biogeography, and conservation of freshwater fishes. Nicholas has over 150 published papers, book chapters, and reports and three books on the biodiversity and conservation of Canadian freshwater fishes. Today, Nicholas is going to discuss the Canadian research in support of Asian carp management. So, Nicholas, I'd like to give the presentation over to you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Christine, and, and thank you for all of you sitting at your computers watching this presentation today. So today, over the next uh, half hour, 40 minutes or so, what I would like to do is just uh, provide an overview of the uh, research that we've been doing in Canada in support of Asian carp management. Now, the challenge we have uh, with doing such research in Canada is that Asian carps aren't currently established here, and hence uh, we cannot do experiments directly on Asian carps. So uh, how do we overcome this challenge? I thought it might be good if we first uh, went through a review of the invasion process and then the actions that we can take uh, to, to uh, manage uh, the potential introduction of Asian carps into Canada. So when we look at the invasion process here, uh, the first step is that the invasive species, such as an Asian carp, enters the pathway. And the pathway could be a physical pathway, like a canal, or it could be a, um, a trade pathway, such as the live food trade or the uh, bait trade. And once in that pathway, uh, the, the species is tran transported either under its own power, if it's through a canal, or uh, by other means uh, through, the trade through trade pathways. At uh, some point it is released into an ecosystem in to which it's not native, such as uh, our aquatic ecosystems in Canada. Then uh, it may survive or perish. If it survives, then it may reproduce or not. If it reproduces, it, it may spread. And if we have that survival, reproduction, and spread, ultimately there may be an impact of the invasive species. Now we can map the invasion process, or we can map uh, um, uh, the management actions to the invasion process. And the management actions that uh, I'm really going to highlight today uh, are, are two such actions that can be classified as risk assessment and risk management. So under risk assessment, we typically look at two main items, probability of introduction and, and magnitude of impact. And within probability of, a, of introduction, we look at arrival, survival, establishment, and spread. You can see how uh, those di different elements of probability of introduction map against the invasion process. Then there are, are risk management actions that uh, can be undertaken associated with the different st stages of the invasion process, including prevention, 
where we would prevent uh, a species from entering the pa a pathway in the first place or, or being transported. Uh, early detection or, and rapid response where we would detect the species soon after it was released into the wild. And then uh, if, if it's been released, it's survived and, and reproduced without detection, then we would be going into uh, a control uh, phase of risk management. Now getting back to uh, the challenge, how can Canada contribute to research on Asian carp so they are not currently established in Canada? Well, we have been using this invasion process for framework to, to undertake research in the highlighted areas here. So my talk is, is basically structured uh, by going through examples of research that we've done in, in each one of these stages under risk assessment and risk management. So uh, in terms of uh, risk assessment, uh, I'll talk about the arrival survival establishment, establishment spread and impact and under risk management prevention, early detection, rapid response, and control. So because the primary pathway for the introduction of Asian carps is actually in the, in the United States, and that primary pathway would be the Chicago Shipping and Sanitary Canal east into the Great Lakes Basin, uh, our contribution to research related to uh, arrival through primary pathways um, is limited in Canada. However, uh, the research that we're undertaking in Canada contributes to better understanding of the secondary pathways such as ballast water and bait fish and live food trades that, that may also bring Asian carps to Canadian waters. Here's an example of research that was done by DFO and the University of Windsor that looked at uh, how ballast moved between ports within the Great Lakes Basin in uh, Lakers. Uh, those those are the species that, or sorry, the the ships that are limited to the Great Lakes Basin. And, and what we see from here, or is that uh, there is substantial movement of ballast water between the American and Canadian sides of the Great Lakes. Uh, and hence, uh, we concluded in our previous risk assessment on big-headed carps that ballast water uh, was a secondary uh, pathway of arrival of concern. In terms of survival, uh, if you saw the Asian Carp 101 webinar, you've seen this image before. Uh, this is research that, uh, that DFO and the University of Windsor uh, did several years ago to look at the, uh, the potential distribution of uh, Asian carps in Canada. And in fact, what this does is it compares the habitat, largely climate, in the native range to the potential habitat in uh, North America. And what we see is that based on this statistical model, that big head and silver carps, and we have similar results for grass carp as well, could readily survive far into Canada, including throughout the Great Lakes Basin. And you can see that silver, silver carp has uh, an even more northern uh, predicted range limit. This isn't really surprising because when we talk about Asian carps, uh, we need to think about Asia as uh, having climates ranging from tropical to uh, polar. And remember, for example, that uh, Siberia is in Asia. And in fact, I've caught uh, silver carp and grass carp in a lake in Siberia, which gets uh, an ice cover about a meter thick in the winter. So these are very much temperate species. And if you had seen the Asian Carp 101 seminar, uh, you would have seen this graphic. And what I'd like to do now is just walk you through the research that resulted in this uh, graphic or the research that was behind this graphic. So essentially what this is doing, for those of you who haven't seen it before, is it's identifying 
uh, how many suitable uh, how, how, how many tributaries in Canada are, have suitable uh, spawning conditions for Asian carps? In, un, in order to identify or predict suitable spawning conditions, we first need to, be, to understand uh, the spawning biology of Asian carps. And this is the biology in a nutshell, and I'll, I'll walk you through it. So what happens is that the Asian carps, all, all four species, uh, need to uh, grow to a certain size over several years uh, before they can mature. And that growth is related to this, um, this uh, 2,685 growing degree days greater than zero. So this is basically a measure of growing season and the length of growing season. So it has to, the species has to have to grow to a certain size for them to mature. And then within the year in which they will mature, uh, they then have to uh, grow uh, at the beginning of the season for uh, a certain amount of time, 600 to 900 growing degree days, uh, before they are ready to actually spawn, that is um, drop eggs in sperm. In addition, there needs to be a trigger for them to migrate up streams to spawn, and that trigger may be either a spike in flow or in temperature, and there's some uncertainty as to uh, which or a combination of both uh, actually triggers uh, the carps to, to migrate upstream to spawn. And then once they've done the migration, they actually have to find suitable spawning habitat, which um, is typically areas of turbulence within the stream. And uh, for example, in the Mississippi River, uh, it's found that uh, highly suitable spawning areas are, are downstream of wing dikes. And wing dikes are con concrete um, projections into the river behind which there is uh, uh, turbulence is created. So once they've migrated upstream, they found the suitable habitat, they will then uh, drop their eggs and sperm en masse. And then the fertilized eggs will then have to drift downstream until uh, they hatch. And they cannot fall out of drift, out of suspension, before they hatch. Otherwise, they'll fall to, to, into the sediment and they will essentially suffocate and, and not survive to hatch. And the amount of time required to drift is really based on the hatching rate and the, the, um, the velocity of the stream flow. And hatching rate is based on water temperature. The, the warmer the temperature, the shorter the hatching time. The length of stream, therefore, actually required for the eggs to drift in is based on drift time. And once the eggs are are um, fertilized and they drift downstream uh, for the appropriate amount of time they hatch, then they need to fall into suitable nursery habitat that is, is productive for both food and cover uh, for prevention against predation. And that habitat is typically um, heavily vegetated waters. So that's the background on the spawning biology of Asian carps that we, we need to know uh, in order to come up with these predictions of what tributaries in the Canadian Great Lakes Basin would be suitable for spawning. So we can take all that information and actually develop this equation uh, that was presented in a paper uh, by Kokoski et al. Uh, out of the U United States Geological Survey, where you can predict the length of river required for egg hatching. And I'm not going to go through the, the equation in detail, but it, you can see that it incorporates both stream velocity and estimated incubation time. Now, the length of river required is important because in the literature from its native range, um, their native range, it appears that the, it, the species generally needs more than 100 kilometers of stream for this whole spawning process to occur, migration up, spawning, 
eggs drift down and then hatch. So we know, for example, in the Great Lakes Basin, a lot of our streams are dammed, which uh, may shorten the length of river to a length that might be actually too short for successful spawning to occur. That is, if the river's too short, then the uh, eggs will drift downstream and hit the lake before they've hatched and, and then uh, settle out into the substrate and perish. So using this equation, we can actually predict the length of river required uh, for, for egg hatching to uh, occur and, and, and subsequent settling into nursery habitat before it hits an actual lake. So that length of river required will be is will differ on a river by river basis because the stream velocity, the stream flow of each of the rivers, and the water temperatures will differ. So what we've done in the Canadian Great Lakes Basin is we've taken data from over 800 um, hydrographic stations that are maintained by the Water Survey of Canada, and we've used those data in this equation to predict whether or not any given river would be suitable uh, for Asian carp spawning. So the data that we're using from these hydrographic sites is the water temperature and the stream velocity. The one last thing I want to show you here is the relationship between hatching time, so this on the y-axis is hat hatching time and temperature, and I mentioned this earlier, so you can see that as temperature increases, the hatching time decreases. So this is very important. So the warmer the water temperature, the shorter the hatching time, uh, the shorter and theoretically the shorter the distance the, the egg will need to float downstream. I'm going to give you an example of, of one of the graphs we've used uh, for, for one location, uh, the Thames River, to look to look at whether or not the, the river is suitable for uh, spawning for Asian carps, and we have graphs like this for for over 200 of those 800 uh, hydrographic stations. Uh, it was only 200 plus stations that actually had sufficient data for us to undertake these analyses. So what we have is uh, we've com we've com pooled the data into bi-weekly averages. So this is the course of the calendar year from January through to December on a bi-weekly basis. And then uh, what we have is the blue uh, bars represent the average water temperature for that bi-week over a multi-year period. And then uh, this solid line with the dots represents the average water velocity uh, for each of the bi-weeks over the course of the year. And then in addition to the average water velocity, we've also included the minimum velocity and the maximum uh, velocity as well to look at the range and velocities. Now, Couple more things on this graph. This vertical dashed line represents the 900, uh, sorry, the 650 degree days required for the initiation of the spawning migration. Uh, so it's less it's known as the onset of spawning, and then this second vertical line represents the uh, the onset of mass spawning. So uh, in this case, you can see that, that uh, in, in southwestern Ontario in the Thames River uh, that the onset of spawning would occur by about uh, by week 13, which is end of April, and then uh, going into May for uh, onset of mass spawning. One last thing you need to uh, know here is this horizontal dash line is the 0 0.7 uh, meter per second water velocity is often thought to be the trigger to a spawning. 
So if we just look at this, uh, we see this hydrograph where in the spring the, the water temperature rises and then it falls into the fall and winter. We see in the spring, we see the spring freshet here. We see an uh, increase in flow in the spring that is a little earlier than, than the increase in, in temperature. Then we see a decrease. Then we see a couple more spikes that are occurring closer to the time of the onset of spawning. And it's possible that these spikes could be the trigger uh, to migration. And then if we put this all together and, the, and we put it into that equation uh, that predicts the length of river required, uh, we have this. So uh, the y-axis here is the river length. We have the same by weeks across the calendar year here. And these, li these lines represent the results of uh, the, the use of that, that uh, river length equation from the previous slide using several hatching times from several different equations. Let's think of it this way. Uh, this is uh, at the uh, maximum hatch hatching rate, and this is at the minimum hatching rate. So the bottom is the maximum hatching rate, the top is the minimum hatching rate, depending on the equation used. So if you look at this, at the beginning of the year, uh, given the temperature and the stream flow, the river actually needs to be relatively short, less than that 100 kilometers. However, it's, it's, um, this, is, this is occurring prior to when spawning would actually occur. So spawning will not occur until this dashed line, and then mass spawning would not occur to here. So anything before then represented here is just not going to happen because spawning has not occurred yet. But you see when spawning has occurred, this is the same, the, the same line except that it's really compressed. And it shows that the river need only be unimpounded for the first, what, 20 uh, kilometers or so uh, for successful spawning to occur. That is, uh, the eggs are going to hatch after as, as little as about 20 kilometers of drift. So in the case of the Thames, uh, which this is, the Thames River is, is actually uh, unimpounded from Lake St. Clair to London for, for over 200 kilometers. So there is plenty of river there that would allow successful spawning to occur um, after the earliest that spawning could occur. And you can see that that persists throughout the most of the summer. And then as the temperatures decline and the flows decline, the river links get, get longer, and then they get greater than 250 kilometers. So the key is here. Right in here, these are short river links that are shorter than the, uh, than the unimpounded length of the Thames River in this case. So we would predict that this is a suitable spawning tributary for Asian carps. Now, the, we did this for the 200 plus graphs, and that's how we ended up back at these numbers. Right, so interpreting the graphs in, in those ways allowed us to come up with the number of suitable uh, spawning rivers out of the total number of rivers for which we had sufficient data for each one of the Canadian Great Lakes basins. Okay, uh, uh, DFO and the University of Waterloo uh, also looked at uh, how quickly Asian carps would spread into Canada if they got initially into the Great Lakes from the, uh, the vicinity of the Chicago area waterway system. And these are different models with different variables and over time. So year, this means year one, year five, year 10, year 20. Just, we'll just look at this first one, this first model to begin with. And you can see after, in the first year, the, all these little dots represent uh, uh, the uh, visitation by at least one individual 
of Asian carp uh, through Lake Michigan. So in the year one under this model, it's uh, the species is largely restricted to Lake Michigan, but by year five, you see that um, many individuals have been able to move throughout Lake Michi Mi Michigan, and some of them have moved into Lake uh, Huron, and then by year 10, you see that there's been a lot of movement into Lake Huron, and by year 20, that has, movement has moved all the way into Lake Erie as well. <clears throat> Interestingly, under these scenarios, it still has not, after 20 years, has not made its way into either Lake Ontario or Lake Superior, but after 50 years, it has made it to all five Great Lakes. So this is an example of the type of research that was done, again, by DFO and the University of Waterloo to uh, inform how quickly Asian carps would spread to, to Canadian waters if introduced through the Chicago area waterway system. In terms of the impact, uh, DFO and the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry uh, did develop uh, ecosystem models, uh, and this is a simplified example of one, to look at the potential impacts that Asian carps, in this case this is a big head carp, and this is a silver carp, would have on the rest of the ecosystem. And I won't get, go into detail here, but I just want to show you the give you a flavor of, uh, or a taste of the flavor of the, uh, the research that was, uh, was done uh, on impact. Now we're going to move over to that, the second part of that, the, the management actions uh, as they relate to the invasion process and look at risk management. Uh, the first, first step uh, and the preferred step for risk management is prevention. Now keep in mind that there are limited Canadian opportunities to conduct research directly on the primary pathway into Canada, which is the Chicago Sanitary and Shipping Canal, because it's wholly within the United States. However, we can conduct research on secondary pathways and, and how we could prevent spread through secondary pathways. Um, we can look at secondary spread, for example, through canals. Uh, we can look at uh, how we might prevent secondary spread through ballast water and through bait fish and live food trades. So in, uh, in terms of ballast water, I showed you in an earlier slide uh, a figure from, from a paper con uh, based on research by DFO and the University of Windsor on uh, how ballast moves within the, in the Great Lakes Basin through Lakers. Well, that analysis and others um, uh, allow us to predict potential port-to-port -port movement within the Great Lakes uh, to inform potential regulation. And, and we're doing some additional work here at University of Toronto Scarborough uh, that will contribute to uh, better understanding the, the the potential risks of a movement of Asian carps through ballast water and with the idea that this research could inform potential regulation to prevent such movement from occurring. So uh, we are also doing research in Canada to develop tools to detect the presence of AIS in trade including Asian carps, with the idea that if we can detect them in trade before they are actually released into the wild, we may be able to prevent that introduction into the wild. Now the challenge uh, that we have of uh, detecting the presence of, of AIS in trade is that what we're trying to detect often is the needle in the haystack. That is uh, perhaps a low number of illegal fishes in a shipment of a large number of legal fishes. So think about um, a, a bait bucket or a, a bag of bait of which most are, are legal bait fishes, but there may be one or two juvenile Asian carps in there. How do we, how do we quickly detect uh, the, those one or two Asian carps? Or uh, if, if uh, a shipment of 
of uh, legal uh, live food fish are coming in in a transport tra trailer uh, with a large volume of water, and there are, only, there are a couple of illegal uh, adult uh, species such as Asian carps in a, a whole, you know, within thousands of legal fishes. How do we detect them? Well, we're we're currently conducting two types of research to to make the detection of the presence of AIS and trade easier. Uh, one one direction of research is related to environmental DNA, and and uh, that is uh, will be the topic of another webinar. And uh, DFO, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and the University of Windsor are working together to develop methods to detect AIS, including Asian carps. Um, sorry, and I should also mention University of Manitoba as well uh, to detect the presence of Asian carps in trade. Uh, just for those of you who are not familiar with environmental DNA, environment, environmental DNA is the DNA that is is found in the in the water in which uh, a species is swimming in terms of fishes, and it's actually shed from the species in terms of their slime and their feces. Uh, another uh, uh, novel method that we're working on developing is the use of underwater cameras, and and uh, you know in the simplest sense, an underwater camera you just put it underwater and you see what you find. However, um, it's not it's not as simple as that. We need to determine uh, wh what the op the optimal effort is required to, uh, to use the underwater camera to detect uh, uh, aquatic invasive species. So, uh, how how long do we have to tape for? Uh, where should we place the camera? Questions like that need to be uh, need to be answered uh, in a quantitative sense for us to determine how to optimally use underwater cameras for the detection of aquatic invasive species in trade. And we are doing that research uh, now at University of Toronto Scarborough. Now, there was uh, a recent webinar on early detection rapid response, so I will not spend a lot of time on this, uh, but for those of you who missed it, the idea is if, if, if we have Prevention is preferred, but if, if we were not successful at prevention, we do want to detect the presence of a species as early as possible with the hope of undertaking a rapid response to eradicate the species. So two key research questions related to early detection rapid responses. What, what method is best for detecting species in low numbers? Uh, and, you know, again, the needle in the haystack. Uh, and how much effort is required to detect species in, in low numbers? So basically, what gear should we be using to detect uh, uh, aquatic invasive species? And how much effort do we need to use in order to, uh, to for detection? So um, we are doing some research related to those two main questions. In terms of traditional methods, netting and electrofishing, we're doing re research. DFO and University of Toronto Scarborough uh, is conducting re research to identify the best gear and the optimal effort to undertake early detection. And then those same environmental DNA techniques and underwater camera techniques that, that we can use in trade, we are also, uh, we. This, 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 we can also use those same methods in the wild for early detection. So we're working, conducting research to, to optimize those methods as well. So uh, the last part of my talk is really going to be related to this control question. Of course, our preference is to prevent. That's what that's what we want to do. If if that fails. Uh, the next step would be to detect early and eradicate. Uh, if for some reason that doesn't occur and 
uh, we have an established population that we need to control. Uh, what can we do to control Asian carps if they do get into Canada? And when you think about control, you need to look, think about, again, those steps within that invasion process. Uh, and the specific steps would be survival, establishment, and spread. So the research that we did on the potential distribution of Asian carps in Canada really tells us, in terms of survival, the climate is suitable in Canada, and there's really not much that we could do to influence uh, survival uh, of Asian carps in Canada. And if anything, uh, Canada is likely to become more suitable for Asian carps under climate uh, warming. So uh, I showed you earlier predictions on, on which tributaries in the Canadian Great Lakes Basin would be suitable for spawning. Well, we could attempt to limit spawning in those tributaries predicted to be suitable by preventing access to them. Uh, for example, through either uh, physical barriers or, or flow manipulation. And I would say right now we're not currently doing any research related to this, and to me this is, would be considered to be a research gap. Now, the, the rest of my talk is really related to uh, controlling spread and the question of can we control spread between the Great Lakes basins? And there are two major re Canadian research projects that are being undertaken to address this question, uh, and they're being uh, undertaken by DFO and University of Toronto Scarborough. And the, the two projects are related to these two questions. Do fishes move through the Welland and St. Mary's canals? And can we prevent movement through the Welland and St. Mary's canals if fish currently do move through the canals. Uh, looking at that first question, uh, there is the potential for, for fishes to move through these canals directly through uh, direct dispersal or indirectly through being carried in, say, the ballast water of fishes uh, between Lake Ontario and Lake Erie in terms of uh, the Welling Canal and between Lake Huron and Lake Superior in terms of the St. Mary's River. Uh, there has been substantial study on the movement of AIS through the shipping vector, and, and I provided an example of that uh, in earlier slides. However, there have been very few studies on the direct movement of, of AIS through, through canals. So, uh, we set up uh, two, two studies to look at this direct movement through canals, one in the Welling Canal and one in the St. Mary's Canal. And, and our colleagues at uh, the DFO Sault St. Marie office have, have led the, the St. Mary's project. And today I'm, I'm just going to talk about the Welling Canal study. Uh, but the St. Mary's project is, is quite similar uh, to this Welling Canal study. So the objective of this study is to determine whether and how fishes directly move between uh, Lake Ontario and, and er Lake Erie through the Welland Canal. And I want to emphasize that what we're using are existing species that currently are established uh, either in the canal or Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. So we're, we are not introducing any species into uh, this study we are, we are simply using species that currently exist in these systems. So the Welling Canal uh, by, uh, uh, is a, a shipping bypass to Niagara Falls. And it, and it, it allows uh, transit between Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. And uh, it is made up of a series of uh, channels and these numbers represent locks. And you can see that the locks are largely on the Lake Ontario side, and these locks close together are, are a series of locks that are actually allowing ships to go up and down over the Niagara Escarpment. And then we have this large 
channelized area that ends in one more lock at Lake Erie. Now these locks, so the overall canal length is, is about 44 kilometers and there's a lift of about 100 meters uh, from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie. And these locks uh, are huge. They are large enough to allow the, the transit of these large uh, Laker shipping uh, uh, ships. And to give you a better idea of the, the scale of these locks, uh, we can look at them uh, when the canal is drained in the winter for maintenance. And so you, you can see here, uh, here's one of the locks, it's drained. This is a full-scale excavator, so you can see the, the, the size of this lock, and here's an example of a lock that's open with a ship going through it. So these are massive areas. And it, here's uh, one of the locks which is twinned, which means there's side-by-side there's -side locks. And the one thing I want to point out is this is known as a bullnose, and this is where we put some of our equipment, and I'll show you this in some upcoming slides. So in order to look at how fish move through the well and canal, we undertook a study that tagged and tracked fishes through the canal. And we started this study in, in 2012 where we capture, captured, tagged, and released uh, uh, 79 individuals and in 2013, we replicated this again where we tagged an additional 100 individuals and then tracked, uh, uh, and then, and, and then tracked the, the fishes to see where they went. So this is, in the upper right-hand corner, this is an example of the tag that, that was placed into the fishes. And here is an example of the receivers that we put throughout the well and canal system to determine where the fishes are. And I'll show you a map of these in just a minute. Now, so essentially what we did within the canal is we went out, we electrofished some fishes, uh, we conducted surgeries to um, place, uh, we conducted surgeries to place uh, the tags into the fishes, sewed up the fishes, then released the fishes back into the, uh, the canal at certain release sites. In 2012, we, we tagged primarily common carp that we would consider to be a surrogate for Asian carps, as well as uh, several other species. Oh, sorry. In 2013, uh, we added some additional species in there, but again, the main group were the, uh, was the common carp. And here's an example of the, uh, or a map of the, the uh, well and canal system with a map of where all our receivers were throughout the canal. So this is what the receivers look like. And there's a higher density receivers here because this is where we have the greater number of locks. And then there's actually a, a, a bypass channel that goes through some hydroelectric stations. So we put receivers in there as well to see if fishes that were tagged and released in, back into the canal uh, actually use these alternate methods to, to move through the system. And this is a schematic of our receivers and the uh, uh, re release areas, uh, the release areas being primarily here, here, and here. Uh, this is an example of the data we've collected. So from those 179 fishes, we've detected them close to a million times. Each one of these lines represents a single, single fish. The tag lasts for about two years. So you see fishes tagged in 2012 uh, were detected into 2013, but not into 2014 as their battery wore out. Fishes tagged in 2013 were detected into 2014. Uh, and, and we continue to, to um, 
uh, have the receivers in tracking the fishes until they drain the canal uh, for January through March. And, and if you look up here, that's what this period is, this blank period is when the canal is actually drained for maintenance. Okay, so I'm going to go through some of our preliminary results from 2012, uh, 2013, and 2014. So in 2012, 37 out of the 79 uh, tagged fishes were detected again by our remote uh, receivers. Two of them were detected actually leaving the canal towards Lake Erie, one freshwater drum and one common carp. And uh, in order to do that, they had to, buy, they had to go through one to two locks and, and move at least 20 kilometers upstream. In 2013, uh, uh, 40, 48 of the 79 fishes tagged in 2012 were detected. So we had better detection of 2012 fishes in 2013 than 2012, and part of that is because we put out more receivers. And we also detected 91 out of the 100 fishes tagged in 2013. Uh, in 2013, five fishes were detected leaving the canal, four freshwater drum, and a common carp. Three uh, moved towards Lake Ontario, uh, bypassing at least two locks and moving at least seven kilometers downstream. Two went towards Lake Erie, bypassing one lock and traveling at least 25 kilometers upstream. And in 2014, our data collection is still in progress, but to date, uh, we um, uh, we have detected 11 of our 2012 fishes, so a, a few of them at the beginning of the season as their batteries are wearing out, and 55 of our 100 uh, fishes uh, tagged in 2013. And we detected three fishes actually re-entering the Welling Canal from Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. So this basically tells us that fish are moving through the canal and into and out of Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. So the next steps for this project uh, are the data analysis to identify where, when, and why fish are moving, uh, to uh, um, determine whether or not there are areas where a lot of movement occurring, uh, a movement is occurring, and whether uh, there are areas where movement could actually be best controlled. And we'll summarize these results in both scientific and advisory publications. So a second part of the research is if we wanted to, how could we prevent the movement of fishes through canals? So for example, if Asian carps got into Lake Erie, could we prevent the movement of them through the Welling Canal into Lake Ontario if they gone to Lake Huron? Could, could we prevent the, the movement through the St. Mary's River and canal uh, locks and canal into Lake Superior? And in order to answer this question, we, we conducted a fish barrier study uh, that looks at what control measures could be effective in preventing movement. And those co control structures included um, this uh, pressure devices, uh, uh, sonic boomer plates, and several other ones that I'll show you in just a minute. So we conducted this this experiment, we call it a mesocosm experiment because it's much larger than being in a lab, but then smaller than being in the wild. And if any of you have been to Burlington, Ontario, or driven from, say, Toronto to Niagara Falls, across the western end of Lake Ontario is the Burlington Skyway and lift bridge that you can see here. And so this, is, this building here is in the Canada Centre for Inland Waters in which DFO uh, is housed. Uh, this is a, a very large boat slip that is adjacent to the facility. And then this is the shipping canal with the, the Skyway here. And then the, in to, off to the left would be Hamilton Harbor and the steel mills where the sh ships are, are coming and going. So we're using this area as a study area to look at control measures. And what we've done is we've netted off this area and then I'm going to move down to the schematic of the area. So we've, we've netted off this area with two barrier nets, and then we fitted the area with uh, uh, acoustic tag receivers. 
So when we put tagged fish into this area, we, can, we know what their three-dimensional position is at all times. And the idea is we set up this experiment, uh, we put in tagged fish, and then in this barrier zone, we, 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 we test various barriers to see how the fishes in this area respond to that barrier. So, uh, to, in order to carry this, uh, carry out the study, we we tr we are tracking, uh, tagging, and tracking fish movement and responses to the barriers in three three dimensions, where we capture fishes in Hamilton Harbor, tag them, and then release them into the study area. So again, we're we're, we're using existing fishes that are already established in the area, not introducing new species. And then we are car carrying out a series of, of uh, ex uh, experiments with different control measures. And we did that uh, w with uh, 115 tagged individuals in the summer and 100 individual tagged individuals in the fall. And I just want to point out, uh, this is the, the, re the receiver complex. Uh, they're, they're putting together a receiver here. This is Jay Woo Kim, who is the postdoctoral fellow, who is the co-author on, on, on this, this presentation and is the, has been leading, uh, co-leading the, the, both the barrier study and the Welling Canal study. So in the summer of uh, 2014, this summer, we used primarily common carp again, and we looked at the, how these tagged fishes responded to these pressure devices as well as the low frequency sonar in terms of these sonic uh, boomer plates. And then this is what these sonic boomer plates look like. This is the, the devices in the middle of our study area. This is what the pressure device looks like when it's, um, when it's discharged underwater. And th these are the cables when we're, uh, that are uh, providing the, the compressed air to the pressure device. In the fall, uh, we, we tag primarily common carp again and conducted experiments with bubble barriers, underwater speakers, and alarm pheromones. And this is what the bubble barriers look like, and this is what the underwater speakers look like. This is, this is where the steel mills are in the background. And uh, so the next steps for this study are, are the data analysis of the experiments from this summer to test how fish is responded by control measure and by species. Then in 2015, we plan on doing additional experiments uh, related to uh, using new barriers such as uh, carbon dioxide, which we would do in collaboration with the University of Illinois. And then also looking at integrated pest management where we combined uh, uh, several of the barrier types together to see if they were more robust than any one barrier type. And then we would summarize the results in scientific and advisory publications. And just coming down to my last couple of slides, uh, you may be wondering, well, if we can, if we, can we prevent the movement of fishes through the Welling Canal in both directions? If we can, uh, will the fishes actually by, bypass control measures on the Welland Canal that prevent movement from Lake Erie to Lake Ontario? That is, could they actually go over the falls and get into Lake Ontario through, uh, through the Niagara River directly? Well, to look at that question, we're conducting research, uh, DFO and, and University of Toronto Scarborough, is conducting research not by tagging fishes and, and looking to see if they fall over the falls and survive, uh, that, that would not be appropriate, but rather looking at directional gene flow between river resident fish populations above, above and below the falls. So do we see evidence of gene flow between populations above and below the falls? And if so, is it, is it directional? Is it showing that the genes are flowing from above the falls to below the falls, and if so, that would be an indication that, that fish likely are, are surviving the fall. Uh, if we see no evidence of, of, of gene flow, we couldn't rule it out, but it, it suggests that we don't have evidence to suggest that that's actually occurring, this, this direct dispersal over the falls. And I think with that, I will summar, uh, summarize uh, my talk. 
the DFO Asian Carp Program is, has been funding Canadian research in support of Asian carp management, uh, including researchers from uh, DFO, University of Toronto Scarborough, University of Windsor, University of Waterloo, and, and sorry, missed the uh, University of Manitoba who are helping out with the, some of the EADNA work. And the research is related to risk assessment and risk management with emphasis on prevention, early detection, and control. And with that, I'd be happy to take some questions. Okay, well, thank you, Nick. That was a really great presentation. Um, just to remind everyone that if you have a question, to please type it into the question box, and I will ask Nick the questions, and he'll give some answers if he can. So, Nick, um, somebody's already asked a question. Uh, regarding concern with concealment of Asian carp and live shipment of legal species, could water analysis for carp DNA be effective? I know you weren't speaking directly on this, but do you have a comment about that? Yes, well, uh, certainly we are uh, undertaking the research uh, to look at uh, whether or not uh, uh, we, can ex we can find environmental DNA uh, in, in the water that is, is found in the, in the live uh, fish shipments. So when I, when I talk about environmental DNA, that's what I'm really talking about is, is testing the water uh, to determine whether the DNA of the Asian, of Asian carps are present. There are some issues. I think there's, it's a method that is still in development and uh, we're trying to determine you know, how many individuals would you need in there uh, in order to detect them and what is the optimal um, uh, volume of water required for sampling and so on. But, you know, if we could get this to work, uh, you know, eventually we could have a very effective, quick method uh, for doing this type of detection that would be simpler than trying to inspect a, a tanker trailer of, uh, of live fishes. Okay, great. Uh, next question. Uh, are there any pr preliminary results on the experimental barriers at this time? Uh, no, I think it would be premature for us to uh, to um, uh, discuss any preliminary results because the one thing I, I must say is that it's very data intensive to to do this work because it's collecting the position of every every individual of those hundred. Uh, you know, at, at uh, very short intervals, you know, uh, measured in seconds. So uh, there's a lot of da data filtering still to be done. Uh, so in, until we've actually uh, done the data filtering and done the preliminary analyses, it would be pre premature to, to say anything about those control measures. But I would be very happy if uh, uh, to do a follow-up uh, webinar when we do have results. That would be excellent. We'd love to have you back. Um, another question for you. How is the Canadian research that's being conducted uh, related to the ongoing research in the U.S.? Uh, good question. Uh, there is some control research being done at the U.S., and it's being done uh, in, a, in smaller experimental conditions and experimental ponds and in labs, and then it's also doing, being done in the wild. So. Um, what we're doing, I think, really complements uh, what is being done in the U.S., and, and, and this is by design. We have been talking to our U.S. colleagues who have been, who have been doing this work and saying, you know, where can, where can we do value-added research? And the thing about this mesocosm is uh, it, it has, you know, uh, because it's, it's larger than a pond or a lab situation, it's more realistic, but because it's not entirely uh, a wild situation, that we there's we can have greater control um, over any potential confounding factors. So, in terms of that that research and the other ongoing eDNA research and, and so on, the work that we're doing is done in that is done in communication with our American colleagues. We want to make sure that we are not duplicating efforts. So it's complementary work uh, that is being done. 
Okay, great. Um, we're out of time now, but I'd just like to say on behalf of everyone, thank you for your great presentation about Canada's research with regard to Asian carp management. Um, I also encourage everyone to please visit our website at www.asiancarp.ca for more information about Asian carps and new developments, and also to see this webinar and the previous three webinars that are recorded and, will, and are available on the site under the Resources tab. And I uh, hope you all have a, a great day, and I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you all for listening. Thanks.